Chapter 21 Don't forget the Bolson Construction Naming Conventions, Hudson said, as he looked up at Link, who sat atop Spirit. I'm sure you'll find a Goron that meets those requirements. Link, for his part, was not very sure of that at all, but he nodded in agreement to Hudson anyway. If I find anyone, I'll tell them about Terrytown, he said, giving an amused smile. Behind Hudson, the construction workers already started working again. They woke with the first rays of sunlight, ate a quick breakfast of salted fish, and got right to it. One of them, Link thought his name was Matheson, predicted rain later in the day, which sent the crew into a kind of working frenzy. Apparently, he was never wrong about this sort of thing. Thanks, Link, Hudson said, the corners of his bushy mustache rising in a smile. You know, I thought you were pretty strange back in Hudson Hill Village, but now I see you're a pretty good guy. Thanks, I guess? Link thought. Verbally, he said, Well, great. Good luck with Terrytown. I'll make sure to stop by when I visit the area again. He leaned down, grasping Hudson's outstretched hand, shaking it briefly, before sitting back up and clicking his tongue, urging Spirit into a slow walk across the bridge. Once free of the bridge, he rejoined the old road, turning south and beginning the climb back up the hill. As he climbed, he looked back over at the small town in its infancy. As strange as the men founding it were, seeing it lifted his heart. As far as he had seen, the only new settlement created since the fall of Hyrule had been New Kasudo, and that town had been founded by the families of the soldiers that fought and died at the Citadel. It was a town founded by refugees. This new town, assuming it would eventually grow large enough to be called that, was something else. Founded not off of tragedy, or even necessity, but out of hope. A wealthy Hylian's hope for new riches, and Bolson's hope for renown. True, but hope, all the same. It seemed a good omen for Link as he continued on his journey to Death Mountain, and the divine beast, Varudanya. Matheson's predictions came true by midday, as a blustery rain blew in from the west, accompanied by strong winds. As Link made his way across a bridge, leading Spirit by reins on foot, the rain wall hit, immediately soaking him through. Having begun to grow used to getting rained on while traveling by now, Link donned his cloak, cinched the collar tight, and raised the hood. It did little to keep him dry, however, as the bridge passed close by a waterfall, originating from Zoro's domain, that sprayed him with mist, in addition to the rain falling from the sky. The rain did not abate until after he eventually made camp a few hours later, after trudging across the series of bridges that spanned the South Lake Akala and Akala Falls. When he finally did decide to rest for the night, he managed to find shelter under a small overhang in the cliffs surrounding Zora's domain. Unable to find any dry wood, he was forced to go without a fire that evening, but that served him just fine. The cleft in the rock that he'd found was right across from the old Akala Parade Ground. As the sun set, he kept his eyes on the towering citadel, watching for any signs of the remaining guardian he knew was still active up there. To his dismay, he did eventually see the flying guardian that still circled the structure. And it was not alone. When shadows overtook the citadel, the colored lights on the guardian's bodies became more pronounced, revealing to Link that at least two of the six-legged walking guardians remaining active, stalking around the fortress, like they were on patrol. It made his stomach twist in fear and anticipation. None of them ever appeared to notice his small, huddled form so far away. But regardless, he was grateful to mount Spirit again the next morning and make his way away from the citadel. The overcast sky overhead promised more rain. Spring in Hyrule, it seemed, it was a very wet season indeed. Later the next day, he approached the fork in the road that led up towards Death Mountain. Gratefully, he patted Spirit's neck, whispering his thanks for the horse's perseverance. It had rained again, several times, 
as the morning transitioned into afternoon. They still had plenty more to traverse before the day was up, but he felt that this would be as good a place as any to rest up for a time. He dismounted off Spirit's back, grimacing at the soreness that had already begun to set back into his legs. His wet clothes hadn't helped him any, leaving him able to feel the multitude of places that were chafing underneath his tunic and trousers. It's just a wonderful day, he said, removing the cloak from his shoulders and draping it over a low-hanging tree branch. After a moment of hesitation, he removed his tunic as well, twisting it tightly in an attempt to wring the water out of it. Honestly, I can't imagine a better couple of days for travel. Spirit responded by snorting and bending down to eat a tuft of grass. Right. Good idea. Link removed his sodden boots and socks and began to walk around, looking for the means to make a small fire. It would be nice to try to dry off some before getting back on the road. Unfortunately, the rain appeared to have fallen here just as heavily as it had in the Akala Highlands, and it hadn't been clear or warm enough to dry anything enough to make use of. The day had warmed enough, though. That Link didn't feel terribly chilly, even bare-chested as he was. After eating a small meal, he removed his sword from the saddle, unsheathing this silver Zora weapon and admiring its surface. This, at least, seemed perfectly fine with the wet weather he'd been experiencing. He imagined that it would be completely impervious to rust and water damage, considering where it had originated from. He walked over to a small clearing away from the road in spirit. Once there, he took up a swordsman's stance, smiling as his body responded naturally. It knew exactly what to do, even if his own memories of learning such things were non-existent. As he began to go through the motions of the forgotten kata, he found his worries of the day fading away. His mind felt clearer than it had since speaking with Princess Zelda two nights prior, allowing him to reflect from a more detached perspective. He supposed that speaking with the princess as he had should have brought him some peace and comfort, but it had only left him feeling more conflicted, highlighting the gulf that separated them now, both in body and mind. It was clear to him how dedicated he had been when they traveled together. He had been passionate about his duties as her protector. Though he had few memories of those times now, his heart still remembered that dedication and respect he had for her. There was, of course, something else. He would be foolish to deny that he had felt something more for Princess Zelda than just duty and dedication alone. His memory of the Spring of Power provided plenty of evidence for that alone. They had been friends, and Link thought that there could have been more that he felt towards her. He supposed it wouldn't surprise him if he found out that he once had feelings for the princess. She was a beautiful woman indeed. They had traveled together too, seemingly alone. The thought made him feel suddenly flush, and he renewed his efforts to engage with his kata, swinging the sword in a variety of single and double-handed flourishes. A light sweat broke out on his forehead, plastering a few loose strands of hair to his face. The light breeze that blew across him felt pleasantly cool. It was strange to him, the way he was reliving his memories. When he saw them, he did not see them through the eyes of an outsider, but from his own perspective. Yet once removed, it felt like he was reading a book with the pages scrambled. He had little context for any of these things, he knew things that he directly reflected on in the memory. There were three springs. The spring of power, the spring of courage, and another spring. He only knew the location of the spring of power, though he distinctly recalled thinking of their time at the spring of courage during his memory. It was frustrating. The fragments of memory that he saw contained smaller fragments of other memories leaving tantalizing hints at previous experiences with no way to follow those teases to their conclusion. Even his memories of Mipha and Zoro's domain were woefully incomplete, though his time there had certainly helped him piece some of them together to form a larger picture. He set his jaw, beginning to move faster than before, grunting with the exertion of his swings and thrusts. Part of his mind raged at the injustice of it all. He was no naive child, even without his memories, he knew that good would not, could not, always prevail over evil 
like in children's tales. Yet this still felt so wrong. They were not supposed to have failed in the way they did. And whose fault was it? He wouldn't believe that it had been Princess Zelda's, not after what he'd witnessed in the Spring of Power. Had it then been his? Had he not attained what he was supposed to attain, the Master Sword? And his skills with the blade were apparent, even one hundred years later. So then who? Whose fault could it... A woman cried out in terror, breaking his concentration. He grew aware of his surroundings again. The clouds overhead had broken in places, giving way to shafts of golden light that brought out the color of the grass and trees. His body was covered in a layer of sweat from head to toe, and there was a woman in filthy traveler's garb sitting on the ground in front of him, a look of fear in her eyes. Blinking in confusion, Link stepped back, glancing briefly at his sword. He hadn't. No. His sword bore no blood, and the woman didn't show any immediate signs of being wounded. How had she approached without his notice? Had he been so focused that he'd shut out the world around him completely? I'm sorry, I was... distracted, are you alright? He turned the sword over, sinking it into the wet earth point down, and stepped forward, holding his hand out to help the woman to her feet. The woman looked up at him, with some fear, eyes darting from his face to his extended hand. I tried calling out to you, but you wouldn't answer me. I thought maybe you just didn't hear me, but even when I stood right in front of you... He grimaced, feeling his face flush. I was very distracted, it seems. I'm sorry if I scared... You aren't hurt, are you? Not by you, no, she said, before finally accepting his outstretched hand and allowing him to pull her to her feet. He noticed immediately that she was favoring one leg, and he frowned. You're sure? Yes, I... The woman grimaced and looked down at her own feet. I was traveling on the road when a nearby lightning strike spooked my horse. She threw me in, bolted. I think I must have sprained my ankle when I fell. Sprained your ankle? Link asked, thinking of the healing abilities given to him by Mipha. Do you need me to look at it? Maybe there is something I can... Oh, no, sir, the woman said quickly, eyes widening. She hobbled a step back from him, hands up. It's quite all right. I only came over because... You are the first traveler that I've seen on the road for the last two days. I've been trying to make my way up towards the trader's outpost at the foot of Death Mountain, but it has been slow moving because of my ankle. I had hoped that you might be going in that direction. She was clearly a skittish woman, but he could hardly blame her. With a sudden flash of embarrassment, he thought of how he might look. He had been swinging his sword around like, well, a trained killer nearly taking her head off in the process. To make matters worse, he had taken off his tunic, leaving his multitude of scars visible for the woman to see. It must have taken a great deal of courage for her to even approach. He'd seen no sign of her presence when he arrived in the area. You're in luck, he said, forcing up what he hoped would be an encouraging smile. That is exactly where I'm headed. I will be happy to help you get there. Really? Her shoulders slumped in relief. Thank the goddess. I did not know what I would do if you chose to pass me by. He felt dread in the pit of his stomach, and didn't want to imagine what could have happened to this woman if she had approached someone else. He moved past her carefully, so as to not appear threatening, and pulled his tunic from the tree branch, slipping it back on over his head. When he looked back at her, she inspected the tunic with a curious expression. Such color. I imagine that you must have dyed that in Hatsuno Village, she said. He glanced down at himself, and the blue champion's tunic that he had chosen to wear that day. It was a gift, actually, but I imagine that's where the person that made it could have gotten the fabric. It is very nice. Link looked back at her, smiling and feeling increasingly self-conscious. With auburn hair pulled into a loose ponytail, and faint freckles on her cheeks. She looked like she might have been close to Zelda's age from his memories. She was dressed in a simple blouse and a pair of trousers, though her clothes were very muddy. 
likely from sleeping on the ground during the last couple rainy days. Thanks, he said, before pulling his cloak from the tree branch. Are you hungry or anything? I still have some food left over. The woman patted a small pouch that she had slung over her shoulders. He supposed that she must have been wearing it when she was thrown off her horse. I've been able to eat, at least. Good. After a moment, Link cleared his throat. I'm Link, by the way. The woman smiled warmly at this and stepped forward, still favoring her hurt ankle, holding her hand out to him. I'm Delia. It is so nice to meet you, Link. He shook her hand, noting the strength of her grip and calluses on her fingers. She clearly works hard with her hands, he thought. After shaking hands, he motioned towards Spirit. I imagine you're eager to get off that angle of yours. Do you need me to help you up? That would be most appreciated, thank you. I don't know if I could do so easily with my ankle the way it is. Link approached her, allowing her to place an arm over his shoulder, and helped her hobble over to Spirit, who stood not far away. Once there, he held her injured leg steady and lifted her up, allowing her to vault her other leg over the saddle. When she was seated, he adjusted the stirrups and helped her slip her injured foot into one. How is that? He asked when he stepped back from her. Comfortable? Yes, thank you, she said, smiling warmly down at him. A moment later, she frowned. But what about you? I don't want to force you to walk the whole way. I'm sure we could both bed if needed. Link felt a sudden heat rise up in his neck, and he shook his head. No, I'm all right. Spirit would probably appreciate having someone lighter than me on his back anyway. He's been ridden pretty hard these last few days. I can walk. If you're sure, I'd just hate for you to have to walk so far. It's not a problem. Link sat down on the grass, pulling back on his socks and boots, which were still damp. With some irritation, he noticed that one of his socks now had a hole in it, allowing his big toe to poke out. Sighing, he pulled his boot on over that foot and laced it up. When he stood up, he couldn't help but to think that, yes, the walk would be uncomfortable, with how damp his clothes and boots were. But there was nothing to do about it. Such a long ride with the two of them sharing the saddle would just be as uncomfortable, as far as he was concerned. He stepped up to the horse. Excuse me, I just want to get this. He untied his sheath from the saddle, careful not to accidentally touch Delia's leg in the process. His earlier thoughts of traveling alone with Princess Zelda had put him in a poor mindset altogether, and he scolded himself. Still, it might be nice to have someone to talk to, if only for the rest of the day. Something to keep him from dwelling on his thoughts of the past. That is a very nice sword, Delia said as he strapped the scabbard to his back, and then retrieved the sword. Link used the grass to wipe off any mud, and clung to the blade after being stuck into the ground, and then sheathed the sword. It too was a gift, Link said, smiling wryly. In fact, just about everything I have with me was a gift, one way or another. It sounds like you have generous friends. Something like that. What is that on your hip? Another gift? She pointed to the Sheikah slate that Link still wore. Oh, this? Link reached down, running his fingers along the Sheikah slate's cool surface. It's just something that I'm holding on to for a friend of mine. He wasn't sure why, but he suddenly found that he didn't want to answer any questions about it. He reached forward, taking Spirit's reins and gently pulling the horse around, so that he was facing uphill. If you don't mind me asking, why were you traveling alone anyway? Link asked, as they began to walk up the muddy dirt road. He'd left the brick roads behind, as he left the Akala Highlands. I was under the impression that these roads can be dangerous. Aren't you traveling alone? Dahlia asked, curious. Well, I'm armed. Link smiled back at her patting the sword hilt over his shoulder. I have some family that live up at the outpost. I hope to spend some time with them, she said, looking a little embarrassed now. To be honest, I assumed that I would just be able to outrun anything I came across on my horse. Some of the monsters around here have horses of their own, Link said, his eyes meeting spirits. He patted the horse on the nose fondly. Where did you travel from? Ateno village. Link looked back at her, eyebrows raised. Really? I just purchased a home there. I don't remember ever seeing you around the town, though. 
My family are farmers. We don't travel into town very often. Unless we're purchasing supplies. I haven't really spent a lot of time there anyway. I've been doing a lot of traveling. I purchased the home more to keep some of my things, instead of making poor spirit carry everything that I don't immediately need. Why are you traveling so much? You came from Akala, didn't you? Link flushed a little at the question, still not really sure what he should say to questions such as these. He didn't like the idea of everybody knowing his true mission. I'm... the traveling researcher, he finally said lamely. Oh? What are you researching? Guardians. He frowned as he looked away from her. He probably should have chosen something like the Sheikah Shrines. At least he had some inkling of what those were really like. I'd heard that there were some functioning ones still in the Akala Highlands. Were there? He glanced back and saw that Delia had leaned forward in the saddle, showing a great deal of interest in his words. The back of his neck grew warm again. A few, he said, thinking back to those he saw on and around the Citadel. I didn't want to approach too close, lest they decide to attack me. They sound scary, from the stories I've heard. I've never seen one up close. That seemed odd to him for some reason. But before he could think about it any further, she continued speaking. My grandfather said that he saw them when they attacked the castle. He grimaced. What terror the people of Hyrule must have experienced when the Guardians, creations made to protect them, turned and attacked. The familiar sense of shame fell onto his shoulders, like a heavy weight. If only things had happened differently. If only they'd been more prepared. You don't really look like a traveling researcher, Delia said. How do you imagine a traveling researcher to look? I don't know. She sat back up straighter in the saddle, looking up thoughtfully. Older, I suppose? Scrawnier? I'm a little older than I look, Link said. Chuckling softly. But you're not scrawny. You look like you've seen a lot of battles, actually. Researching guardians can be pretty dangerous work, if you aren't careful. And I have a tendency of walking into trouble. He looked forward again, but he could still feel Delia's eyes on him from behind. Thankfully, she did not press any further with her questions, and soon the conversation turned to less personal matters that didn't require Link to outright lie. Together he and Delia traveled up the road for a couple more hours, before she asked if they could stop. The sun was beginning to set in the west, and they were still a couple of hours from the outpost at least. Traveling together slowed their pace, as Link was forced to walk, and Spirit began to show signs of tiring. Link noticed, though, that the land around them was beginning to show subtle signs of change. The color of the grass had shifted from a verdant green to a paler color, with shades of yellow. The dirt had begun to show a hint of red. They were nearing the base of the volcanic mountain range. Are you doing all right? Is it your ankle? Link asked as he slowed Spirit to a stop, looking back at her. No. Well, yes, a bit. It's aching a lot, and I'm tired. Would this be a good place to stop for the night? Link looked back up the hill. We aren't too far from the trader's outpost now. Are you sure you wouldn't like to keep going? It's maybe another couple of hours up the road. Please? My ankle feels like it's getting worse. And I'm wary of being in the saddle. I'm sore. He grimaced, thinking that her choices for riding would be to put pressure on her ankle, to relieve herself from the constant bouncing of the saddle, or just to endure a sore backside. It sounded to him like she ended up with both. Yeah, of course. Here, he said, walking over to the saddle. I'll help you down. Delia smiled gratefully down at him and leaned over, placing her hands on his shoulders. After a moment of embarrassed hesitation, Link carefully placed his hands to either side of her hips, helping her off of the horse and setting her down onto the ground. Once she was firmly on the ground, he released her hips and turned so that she might wrap an arm around his shoulder again. Thank you so much for all of your help, she said, as he walked her over to a small grassy mound, where he helped her sit. I know that I've probably slowed you down terribly. It's really all right. I just wish we'd seen your horse out here somewhere. Ling stood back up, turning back to Spirit and beginning to pull his saddlebags free. I'm glad you have family to stay with when we get there. Are they expecting you? 
They knew I would try to stay with them in the spring, but we didn't discuss any other time frame than that. Delia gently rubbed her ankle through the leather of her boots. He thought that she would probably feel better if she removed them, but didn't voice his thoughts. Would it be better if I rode ahead and retrieved one of them? Maybe they could bring a wagon or something to help carry you. That way you wouldn't have to spend another night outside. She smiled up at Link and shook her head. One more night won't hurt me. Besides, I don't mind the company. Link felt his cheeks grow warm. When he'd first met her, she seemed like a very shy girl. But she had gained confidence as they spoke throughout the day, and grew comfortable in each other's presence. And he had to admit to himself that he found her attractive. She was no green-eyed princess, true. But she had a different kind of prettiness to her. He thought that she might have a similar attraction to him from some of the things she'd said. Not that he had any intent of taking their apparent mutual attraction anywhere. He had far more important things to worry about than a pretty face. If you're sure, he said after collecting himself, I'll see if I can gather some supplies for a fire. With any luck, maybe I can catch us some fresh meat as well. After ensuring that she was comfortable, he grabbed his bow and arrows from Spirit's saddle, setting off down the hill to where the trees grew thicker. When he later returned carrying a rabbit by its ears with one hand, and a bundle of firewood under his other arm, he found Delia where he'd left her. She had pulled out a brush from her small pack, and used it to delicately brush out the tangles in her hair, which she'd pulled free of her ponytail. Link froze and for a moment did not see Delia at all. Instead, he saw Princess Zelda, seated upon a tree stump, dressed in her travel clothes, brushing her hair with a silver hairbrush. But he did not just see her on a stump. No. He also saw her on a rock, seated on the bare ground, on horseback on a sandy beach. All at once, he saw images flash through his head of the princess brushing her hair in a dozen different positions, wearing a dozen different outfits. It had been a nightly ritual of hers. Link? she asked, looking up at him curiously. Blinking rapidly, Link dispelled the images, taking a deep breath. When he opened his eyes again, the images of Princess Zelda had faded, replaced by the single image of Delia, looking at him with a concerned expression. It hadn't been the princess who had spoken. Oh, sorry, I... distracted. Link cleared his throat, trying to hide the sudden uncomfortable urge she got to be away from this woman who, for the briefest of moments, brought images of the princess to his mind. You get distracted a lot, she said, slipping her hairbrush back into her pack. For a brief moment, he thought he saw a flash of white in the pack, but it had been too quick for him to see any kind of detail. You need to be more careful, or it will be the death of you one day. I'll take that under advisement, he said a little more gruffly than he meant to. He set the wood down on the ground, placing the dead rabbit down next to him. Poor little guy, Delia said, looking at the rabbit. He had no idea what was coming. I'd be a poor hunter if he did, Link said, trying to inject some humor back into his tone. She didn't deserve for him to get moody around her, just because she had been brushing her hair. Indeed. She watched him as he assembled the bundles of sticks into a small stack before he took out his belt knife and began to shave pieces of bark off to use for kindling. I can skin the rabbit, if you'd like, she offered, after a few minutes of watching him prepare the fire. He handed the dead rabbit over, along with his knife, and she went to work while he set about starting the fire with a rock and a piece of flint. When he finished, he looked with some satisfaction at the small but healthy fire that he'd been able to get started. The warmth was a welcome change after the last two nights of damp chill. Delia proved to be adept at skinning the rabbit as well, her cuts delicate, so as to preserve the animal's pelt. That was good. Link might be able to trade it for a few rupees in the outpost. He did not have many rupees left to his name at this point, and Pura had not been willing to part with any more after he convinced her to buy his house for him. He supposed that he would probably split whatever the amount he sold the rabbit pelt for with Delia, though. By the time she had finished, he had set up a small stand for his cook pot, using leftover wood and stones to lift it off the fire. He took over the cooking, cutting the rabbit meat up, and combining it with other vegetables and herbs he had, or had foraged. 
Wow, Delia said, as she watched him prod the meat with a wooden spoon. I hadn't expected that you would be such a good cook as well. Link glanced up at her and smiled, shrugging his shoulders. Just something I picked up, I suppose. She hummed a response, and Link looked back down at the pan, satisfied with how everything was looking. He carefully removed it from the fire, setting it down on a flat stone that he carried over. Once satisfied, he held the wooden spoon out to her. I don't really have any plates or utensils, he explained at her questioning look. She took the spoon, and he took the knife, wiping it before letting the fire burn off any excess blood from the blade before using it to spear a chunk of rabbit. They ate in silence for a time. Link was mostly satisfied with dinner, but he felt like something was missing, though he just couldn't place a finger on it. He felt certain, though, that whatever it was must have been locked behind a memory that he hadn't regained. Delia, it appeared, agreed with him, as she fished in her pack after finishing their meal, and pulled out a pair of ripe bananas, holding out one to Link. After their supper, Link laid out his bedroll for her to use, finding her a spot of soft grass before backing away to the other side of the fire, where he'd laid out his cloak, which had gratefully dried by the warm fire. You've been incredibly sweet to me, Link, Delia said, as she watched him clean up and prepare for bed. You didn't have to do any of this at all. What should I have done? Made you go get your own? He said, looking up at her with a wry smile. Regardless, I do not think I will ever forget the kindness you showed me. Link couldn't quite read her expression in the flickering firelight, so he merely shrugged again. I couldn't very well leave someone in need. That's why I'm so glad I found you. He could see her smile from beyond the fire, before she lied down, curling up in his bedroll. He sat by the fire while she settled, before lying down himself, wrapping his cloak around him, and soon falling asleep. She appeared before him, resplendent in her white dress. Her green eyes were like emeralds. Her blonde hair shone with the sun. He couldn't help but to smile at the sight of her. It was nice to see her again. Eyes. She was saying something to him, but it seemed distant, hard to make out. It sounded as though he were underwater. He shook his head to try to tell her that he couldn't understand her, still smiling. Your eyes. He frowned now. Her expression had come into greater clarity. She looked terrified. Her eyes were wide, lips forming her frantic words. Now he heard her. Open your eyes, Link. Wake up. Link's eyes opened with a jolt. Standing directly over him was a dark figure. Face covered by a white mask, bearing an inverted Shika eye. Thank you.